Well, welcome everybody to the fourth annual MMT conference. I'm very happy to be here with Andres Bernal and Jack Hammond. My name is Daniel Hawley and I'll be moderating this afternoon. We're going to start with uh, 20 minutes uh, from Jack, 20 minutes from Andres, and we'll have a chance for questions and answers. Feel free to put them in the chat along the way, uh, but there will be time at the end. Jack Hammond teaches sociology at Hunter College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Most of his work has been on social movements in Latin America and elsewhere. His books are Building po Popular Power, Workers' and Neighborhood Movements in the Portuguese Revolution, and Fighting to Learn, Popular Education and Guerrilla War in El Salvador. Most recently, he's been working on environmental sociology, emphasizing eco-socialism and degrowth, and he's an active member of the PSC, the CUNY Faculty Union. Andres Bernal is a lecturer at City University, New York, Queens College, Department of Urban Studies and the School of Labor and, the, and Urban Studies. He's currently finishing a doctorate in public and urban policy at the New School. Andres is a research fellow at the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity and a fellow at the Post Growth Institute. He is a co-executive director of Public Money Action and a senior policy advisor currently with the Neil Walia campaign for Congress in Denver's first district. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jack. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to say I was very surprised to get this invitation. I'm very happy to get the invitation to speak here. But as you just heard, I'm not an economist. I'm a sociologist. I'm definitely not an expert in modern monetary theory, although I have been following it and doing my best to understand it for the last couple of years. Um, and I decided that what I could talk about today was how the growth throws light on modern monetary theory as far as I understand it. Uh, I hope I succeed in uh, presenting uh, and the, my, my presentation of modern monetary theory is adequate to that task. Um, I want to start out by saying a couple of things that they have in common. One is that the jobs guarantee is an important part of the policies of modern monetary theory, and it's also an important part of degrowth. So I'm going to talk about how that might work and what are some of its ramifications. A second thing that they have in common is the contempt for both of them in the circles of very serious responsible people like mainstream economic departments and um, major environmental organizations, not only those that believe in accelerationism or eco-modernism, uh, eco but also some of the more mainstream organizations that um, talk about uh, decoupling economic growth from environmental contamination with the conviction that that's possible. Uh, most degrowth scholars uh, don't believe that it's possible. Um, between degrowth and modern monetary theory, there are um, some important differences, however, and my talk will highlight the degrowth aspect. First of all, modern monetary theory is by definition about money. Uh, its major variables, its major prescriptions involve money, whereas degrowth, it, mon mon money is really very secondary. It's really about matter and energy, how much uh, raw materials do we use? How much energy do we use? Secondly, modern monetary theory is about public policy. Its output is public policy. Degrowth has very important implications for policy, but it's also to a very uh, significant degree, it's about how we live. It's about the personal level and it prescribes a good life for everyone within planetary limits. Um, and I want to make clear that I'm a strong advocate of degrowth. I believe that it is the only environmental program that really has a strong chance, and even there, not a certainty, but a strong chance of solving 
are environmental problems, which include not only climate change, but a whole lot of others involved in resource extraction, resource use, and uh, waste disposal. Uh, I think that the degrowth prescription has at least some promise, as I say, of resolving them and most other uh, uh, most other um, programs are uh, Im have important contributions to make but are inadequate to solving the problem. So what is degrowth? What is the idea behind degrowth? Um, the name itself is somewhat problematic because it isn't primarily about growth or non-growth. Growth is measured by economists in GDP, gross domestic product. Um, degrowth um, implies a reduction in gross domestic product, but that's not the objective in itself. It's a likely outcome of other objectives. And I want to just say a little bit about why we don't pay attention to gross domestic product, even though it is the primary economic statistic. It's the measure that is used by most policymakers, most politicians, and most journalists about the success of the economy. Um, but there are a number of things wrong with it as a measure of success of the economy, in particular, when it is used to imply that more growth means better lives for all of us. We can look quickly at some statistics that show why that is not possible. Here we have plotting of countries by life expectancy by GDP per capita. And what we see, <coughs> excuse me, what we see when we look at this graph is that for very low levels of GDP per capita, improvements, relatively small improvements, make a big increase in life expectancy. Whereas once you get up to middle income and even lower middle income countries, you find that further growth in GDP does not improve life expectancy at all. And I could show you a graph that looks like this for many other outcomes that we are all interested in, in um, understanding the relationship between economic growth and the quality of our lives, that for very low levels, the in economic growth makes a big difference. For medium to high levels, it is basically a flat line so that more growth doesn't give us longer lives. Um, in other words, GDP does not measure social well-being. Uh, the inventor, the, the primary designer of GDP, we called in his day GNP, Simon Kuznets, says the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measure of national income. So when we discard this attention to economic growth later, what do we have instead? It is, as I said before, degrowth. The objective is a good life for everyone within planetary limits, which entails a planned decrease in the use of materials and energy in wealthy countries while maintaining the standard of living. Um, and in this um, phrase, there are two, there are three very important pieces. One is um, it's a decrease in the use of materials and energy. It's physical quantities that we want to um, and economize on to, to restrict the use of. It's something that involves wealthy countries because we recognize that poor countries do have to grow, do have to increase their output in order to guarantee a reasonable standard of living to their whole population. Although the kind of growth will be different from what most of them are, are pursuing today. Nevertheless, we believe that they have to grow. And in compensation, wealthy countries have to shrink their use of materials and energy so that their ecological footprint, the combined ecological footprint, does not continue to grow. And maintaining the standard of living in wealthy countries, we argue that it is possible to maintain the standard of living with considerable reduction in materials and energy. 
um, if we try to uh, have an economy in the service of needs rather than profit, and if that economy pursues equality and universal social services, um, among these social services is the job guarantee, the job guarantee that the um, government will provide employment for anyone who wants to work and for whom the private market doesn't provide a job. Um, these jobs should all be at reasonable pay to maintain a reasonable standard of living with um, benefits. Benefits are not necessarily provided through the job, the medical care and um, old age pension assistance were more likely to come universally separate from the employment economy, um, but also with these jobs should all have access to unionization and representation. And all of these things bring me back to the initial definition and the fact that degrowth is really about the good life. It's not just about material standards. It's not just about taking care of people, but people enabling them to take care of themselves, enhancing their capabilities in the language of Amartya Sen. Now, this raises the question, how can we have a job guarantee? How can we have full employment at the same time that we decrease the use of energy and resources? Because jobs use energy, jobs use resources. And if we increase the level of employment above what the market might provide, we <clears throat> face the possibility that they will not, um, that, that, will, that, there, that these um, uh, material uses will increase. Well, I'm going to talk about three ways in which we can do that, in which we can maintain full employment and decrease the use of energy and resources. One is by recognizing the um, skewed nature of consumption. This graph, the champagne glass graph from Oxfam, is about CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions that are the worst culprit in, um, in climate change. Uh, but I'm using them as an indicator of consumption. The greater the emissions, the greater the consumption of material and resources. And if we look at the world population's rich 10%, the top decile by income, we see that they are using up 49% of the consumed um, materials and resources. Then if we look at the bottom half, the poorest 50%, they add up to 10%. So if we round this 49 up to 50, we have 10 to 50 and 50 to 10. 10% 10 of the population is producing, is, is using up 50% of the resources. Half of the population is using up 10% of the resources. As we see here in a slightly different view, where we have household carbon footprint by income level and um, the in income, those with income less than $5,000 a year. The, the previous graph was the world. This one is the United States. Um, the uh, population with less than $5,000 income a year is uh, producing about one quarter or less of the emissions produced by the top group with 150000 And if we could change this distribution of consumption by changing the income distribution, if we could reduce the income of the wealthiest, um, we would have much less uh, use of resources by that over-consuming segment of the population. We could reduce their incomes through redistribution through taxes, through pre-distribution by financial regulations, by corporate regulations of CEO pay to uh, worker pay ratios, and by strengthening the institutions, such as unions, that um, en enhance the well-being of the lower income strata. A second way in which we could do, achieve that reduction is by redirecting production to non-material goods. Tim Jackson offers us care, craft, and creativity, occupations in which are clearly work, which clearly involve 
uh, people in uh, labor processes, but which have usually a low material intensity. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley has proposed a guaranteed job resolution and offers these kinds of examples of the projects that could be undertaken by people so employed, which include care for children and, and seniors, uh, staff of public education and early childhood learning, after school programs, leisure programs, community infrastructure for environmental cleanup, um, emergency preparedness, public art, all of these things are activities that would enhance the life of people in the communities and have a relatively low material footprint. But the main way I think that we should think about reducing the use of materials is by shortening the work week. In 1930, Keynes wrote an essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, in which he said that if the next hundred years improve the productivity of the economy um, as much as the last hundred years have done, we would all be able to live at the same standard of living for on um, 15 hours of work per week. Keynes wasn't concerned about the environment. He wasn't concerned about the use of materials. These were not his major preoccupations. He was concerned about the workers and the uh, toll that their work week takes on them, on us, and how we might live better with less work, but still with a similar level of material consumption. Now, the, the productivity has kept up with Keynes's prediction. We're not quite at 100 that years yet, but we have productivity about four times as high over the last century. Um, whereas the work time, as most of you have probably noticed, has not declined to 15 hours a week. In fact, the um, working hours have been a constant source of struggle since uh, the Industrial Revolution. And if they could be changed, we would come out with a shorter working day, we would consume fewer resources, we would decrease the use of energy, we would reduce emissions. But starting with the Industrial Revolution, working hours, um, when people were leaving the countryside, losing their lands to enclosure, looking for new kinds of employment, the number of hours that they had to work in order to make a half decent living increased dramatically. The factories of the Industrial Revolution of 14 hour days, even 16 hour days were not at all unknown. And this was a subject of enormous worker struggle. The first known strike for um, uh, work time reduction was uh, Philadelphia Carpenters in 1791, demanding a 10 hour day. A um, hundred years later, there was a strike movement for the eight hour day, um, culminating in a major demonstration in Haymarket Square in Chicago, uh, at which uh, an unknown person threw a bomb, several people were killed, and several anarchists in the demonstration were tried, convicted, and executed as being accused of being guilty of throwing that bomb or being responsible for it. But the Haymarket strike uh, remained very important in our history. The, there was a there was a major demonstration was called for May 1st, and the commemoration of that major demonstration gave rise to May Day, celebrated as International Workers' Day in practically every country of the world except the country where it originated. It also produced a song uh, called Eight Hours. We want to feel the sunshine and smell the flowers. This brings us back to my point about degrowth being about the way that we live and not just about the hours or the pay that we get. We want to be able to enjoy our lives, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. Having control over our work time, having limits to our work time, and having more time over which we have control is an expression of freedom and one which degrowth uh, 
along with many other uh, active workers' movements, believes that we are all entitled to. But there were setbacks. Um, a major setback was the Supreme Court Lochner case in 1905, in which the Supreme Court ruled on courts on constitutional a New York state law uh, limiting the working hours of bakers because, according to the Supreme Court, this violated the freedom of contract of the worker and the employer to decide between themselves what how many hours they would work and what they would get paid for it. And that became the guideline to government policy, not only work hours, but in general, labor management relations saying that the um, the government could not legislate limits on those relations, something which did change with the New Deal, the Fair Labor, Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, which set up standards for overtime and regulated. It didn't it um, didn't mean that they couldn't the employers couldn't demand overtime. They could and they can. But at least they had to pay supplemental wages for it. We um, see here that there have been decreases in work hours uh, over the last century, over a century and a half, I guess, starting with um, among seven industrial nations, including the United States, working hours at about three hour, 3,000 hours a week uh, in 1870, and um, decreasing gradually to about maybe 1,600 hours a week in 2017. By the way, at least one standard for uh, hunters and gatherers uh, in the anthropological literature tells us that they worked on an average 1,700 hours a week, which is not so different from what is the case in the United States today. And you can't see from this graph, but you will better see from the next one, that the United States, which in the earlier days was um, similar to other industrial nations, but in the 20, in the last half of the 20th century, while working hours continued to decline a little bit in the US, they did not decline nearly as much as was the case in other industrial nations. Our trade union movement um, is very weak, as we all know, and even to the extent that it has demands that it has struggled for, working time has not been at the top of their agenda. You can also see that American workers get a bad deal when it comes to vacations and holidays. We are the only major country that doesn't have statutory minimum paid leave every year for workers. Uh, we have holidays, but when you add the required vacation days and the holidays together, uh, the um, American worker gets 10 days a year. In the UK, it's 37. And in the other wealthy countries shown here, in almost all of them, it is at least twice as much as it is in the United States. Now, if we were to get work time reduction, there would be an enormous number of benefits to the mental health of the workers. It would reduce unemployment. It would contribute to macroeconomic, macroeconomic stability. It would clean the environment. Productivity is a little more complicated. The studies that have been done of um, how does productivity change when there actually are reductions in work time, either in a business, in a company, or countrywide by legislation. Um, some studies show distinct gains in productivity. Others show decreases. So we can't say that productivity is a guaranteed benefit of work time reduction, but we can at least study the circumstances in which it turns out that way. And finally, the, the benefit of work time reduction is freedom. We are more free to control our lives, which capitalism uh, has turned our time into a commodity. We sell it. As E.P. Thompson put it, we used to pass time, now we spend time. And um, with shorter working hours, this enhances our ability to do what we want 
with our time. This is the area, by the way, where there's considerable overlap between um, degrowth and mon monetary theory, particularly in terms of the emphasis on the job guarantee in modern monetary theory to reduce unemployment and to stabilize the overall economy. Now, there is, of course, plenty of resistance. I see I've run over a little bit. I'm going to finish up pretty quickly. Uh, there is employer resistance for several clear material reasons, but also for some more transcendent reasons. In our labor force, um, there is a fixed cost per employee, and the uh, employer can, by making workers work more hours, doesn't have additional training time, doesn't have additional benefits to be paid, doesn't have additional payroll taxes, so that adding workers is costlier than extending the workday for those that are already there. There are fears for productivity, as I just mentioned. Sometimes it seems to enhance productivity and sometimes to decrease it. Uh, there is the possibility that it will require and, and adding more people at shorter hours will require lower hiring standards as you reach deeper into the labor pool. But the main thing, I think, for employers is the loss of control, being able to dictate workers hours, being able to dictate the total number of hours, and being able to dictate the schedules of so many workers who are precarious and who have irregular hours, don't know from one week to the next how long and when they are going to have to be working. This is an exercise of control by capital over its workers, which they are likely to see as benefiting them because it enforces the compliance on the workers. Now, I have to add, there are cultural obstacles. People, all of us, internalize to one degree or another a work ethic. We see work as the source of our identity. Um, some are afraid that shorter work hours will lower productivity and bring about economic decline. And consumerism, the many things that we like to buy, we like our stuff too much, and we don't want to lower our consumption of materials and energy because that means we'll have less stuff. All of these things are internalized to one degree or another in the workers and may make them afraid of shorter worker work hours. But there are still there are signs that times are changing. Uh, we have David Graeber's work on bullshit jobs, the jobs that people believe they are doing without any meaning or without any reason for the job even to exist. Um, it's said that millennials are more interested in meaning in their work and less concerned, less willing to comply with the rat race. The pandemic has, of course, fundamentally altered our working patterns for so many of us, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes involuntarily. But I do believe, and the pandemic has been followed, according to some sources, by the great refusal, people who decide not to go back to the kind of job that they had before the pandemic, um, and who are prepared to change their working styles. Um, all of these, of course, are things that are widely discussed in the press, and it's questionable to what extent is there any empirical confirmation of them. But there is a strong suggestion that we may be at a point of inflection, including a resurgence in unionism. We have unionism of Amazon, unionism of Starbucks, unionism of many media-oriented workplaces, um, unionism of many occupations that are not nearly at the bottom of uh, income or prestige in the occupational scale. All of these things, it's, I'm not prepared to predict that any of them is going to produce a general movement towards shorter working hours, but at least they um, offer some possibility of change. And so I just want to finish with re reiterating the definition of degrowth as not being fundamentally 
about economic variables, but about a good life, which we all would be able to realize better if we had a shorter working period. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jack. Andres, we'll go over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andres Bernal. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, my research focuses on the intersection of heterodox economics and mainly MMT as uh, a, an alternative to the neoclassical orthodoxy that we are so used to in the mainstream, a view of economics right, that uh, prioritizes a social provisioning process embedded in institutions, embedded in values, embedded in power dynamics, etc., along with an approach to policy uh, from a critical perspective, sometimes called critical policy studies. Uh, so the idea that uh, similar to orthodox economics, public policy can never be simply a neutral description of things or a, a technocratic practice, but rather is a part of the larger world building process of governance. And then lastly, social theory, which is of course the implicit underlying narratives and assumptions that structure our debates, our language and our discourse. So bringing these three things together, I'd like to share my thoughts about the idea of post-growth as it applies to a Green New Deal. Um, you'll find that um, many of the things that I discuss will actually be very much aligned and in agreement with Jack, and then some things will um, not be necessarily totally in agreement and will move, be moving in a different direction. So I hope to contribute um, to an important conversation and, and debate about the subject. So uh, the Green New Deal as we know it, or the notion that we want to bring in the best of the big investments in public works projects and expansion of economic and social rights from the New Deal, along with elements of the civil rights movement and the Great Society and many of the social movements of the 60s, uh, this is kind of the way that many of our progressive uh, legislators in Congress from AOC to the rest of the squad and then other um, academics and activists have formulated what the framing of the Green New Deal is, um, is kind of meant to address the climate crisis that we're currently in by inspiring a mass mobilization um, in the transformation of our way of life. From the right and from the center, we oftentimes get the criti critique or the criticism that this Green New Deal will crash the economy or that it is just far too expensive, right? And as MMTers, we have been working tirelessly to try to problematize that entire framing. So given that, from those of us that want to engage in ambitious and bold climate action, we find questions about the Green New Deal um, and debates and sometimes contentious discussion about a Green New Deal as to whether it is part or represents green growth on one hand, degrowth on the other hand, or maybe something completely different. Um, in the conversation about green growth, interestingly enough, the term kind of became popularized as a response to the 2008 financial crisis when the world was in a in you know crashing all around us and some people were saying look we need we need big investments and if we're going to talk about growth we might as well start to make an energy transition at this moment however today a lot of times green growth uh seems to be making the claim that things can continue as usual that we can think of the economy as we currently do and just simply make it sustainable uh, this has of course brought up the question of decoupling and whether uh, capitalism, capitalism as we understand it, can be decoupled from the uh, emissions that are driving climate change and the rest of the environmental disasters. And of course, I think that there are many problems with this approach to decoupling, uh, insofar as that every time there seems to be a tension between decoupling and growth, given the way that 
those in power and those that kind of are the intellectual architects of mainstream economics and policy making see it, uh, it's usually green that gets sacrificed and growth that, that keeps on um, going and, and staying firm um, in creating the world. So there are a lot of critiques of green growth uh, have to do with simple greenwashing or the idea that it's just a lot of talk and lip service and there's no actual viable way to uh, accomplish what it says it's going to accomplish. Um, there's a famous kind of quote by uh, Timothy Parikh who talks about absolutely no evidence existing that decoupling uh, emissions from growth is even possible. And so, of course, counter to this is uh, the framing of degrowth, as Jack explained. And interestingly enough, um, in, in the explanation, right, he mentioned uh, that the, the name can be problematic. <laughs> and I think that this is more insightful um, than sometimes given credit to, the, the very notion of degrowth. Um, questions arise about degrowth as to whether, even if we degrow, can we actually uh, decarbonize and, and keep the planet from warming over 1.5 or whatever our goals are in time without inciting a global recession or depression? Uh, additionally, uh, and I think at its best, because I, I, I wouldn't generalize the degrowth movement as one simple thing, but at its best, degrowth finds its, the degrowth movement finds itself often uh, go, fighting an uphill battle against the implications that people believe their standard of life is actually going to go down by degrowing the economy and degrowing uh, incomes. I think in some instances, um, for example, what was very present in the documentary uh, Planet of the Humans produced by Michael Moore, there are aspects of degrowth which can be more problematic, which have been accused of a certain kind of Malthusianism, or rather the, the belief that it's humans that are the problem and we need to scale that down. And this is something that I, I believe also the degrowth movement uh, and, and with, its, with the best intentions faces Two, I uh, am here to argue that both of these debates are premised on the idea that growth is a singular, easy to understand, and even coherent concept. Um, and many of this was in Jack's presentation as well. Growth as we know it, being just a word, is, a st is a, basically a term used to describe GDP which is a statistical measure uh, that has been created by humans, by people, and by many of those that are in power, and is not capable of accurately measuring human well-being, uh, ecological sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. As we know, we could have uh, pris private prisons created and say this is good for GDP. Uh, we could have mass incarceration and say this is good for GDP. We could have... Uh, hurricanes and, and uh, you know, super storms from climate change ravaging our communities and say, well, this is great for GDP because then we can clean it up, right? This is a totally uh, inaccurate and very problematic measure of, of human well-being. And so in that sense, why should we privilege the very notion of growth with a counter term degrowth when the very idea is pretty ridiculous to begin with? Uh, from that perspective, I'm very interested in beginning to deconstruct that very notion of, of, of growth itself. And as the term post-growth kind of implies, and we see in other terms like post-modernism or uh, post-colonialism, it's our work to kind of problematize all the different premises of that term uh, from, from the very get-go. So thinking about uh, something that goes beyond growth or that at least deconstructs it, I think that there are certain perspectives that can help us um, do that kind of work. Some of which, uh, one example of which involves Jerome Vanderberg's idea of a growth or an agnosticism or indifference to growth, whereby we begin to focus on certain social and environmental objectives and goals that we may have. And in some cases, for example, in much of the the global south or in the periphery, it might just be that we experience some growth of GDP, but we don't really care because that's not our point. The point is like, are we meeting certain 
social and environmental standards. And in other areas, there will be a scale down of things that have been destructive, um, uh, that have polluted and that have harmed um, communities and ecologies. And uh, that just happens as well because it falls in line with our uh, social uh, objectives. In both of these situations, GDP itself and growth itself is not the thing that uh, that we prioritize um, at all. So in the green growth model, if we if uh, green investments and sustainability and sustainability threatens growth, we run into a problem. In the degrowth model, it is very possible that if uh, if investments in sustainability run into might actually spur growth in some moments, we can imagine that that can be a problem as well. By rejecting both of those frameworks and thinking about a model indifferent to growth but focused on uh, again social and environmental objectives, we can potentially overcome that limitation once again because gdp is simply a measure and an in a statistical indicator and it is not grounded in some kind of material reality uh, another perspective that can be useful is the idea of qualitative growth um, which brings attention to growth not as some kind of um uh, ongoing exponential material thing or relationship with energy, but questions around the qualitative composition and the purpose around that growth. Uh, for example, uh, shout out to Will Beeman, who um, gave this example to me, right? If we were to uh, measure somebody's emotional state after, for example, uh, uh, two years uh, of the pandemic, and we were to say, we're going to measure your emotional state by how much money you've spent, we would know very little uh, important information about that person. We would actually have to be asking ourselves, well, what did you spend that money on? <laughs> and what did you spend that money responding to? And those, of course, imply a lot of qualitative questions. Now, Fred Block has some interesting things to say about qualitative growth. For one, he talks about shifting the principles of economic organization and production towards the growth of human capacities. This is also in line with uh, Martha Nausbaum's and Amarita Sen's view of the human capacity uh, understanding of, of growth and development to replace GDP. Uh, Block describes this kind of flexibility, dynamic flexibility, whereby institutions and their social actors are able to effectively use and develop technologies based on their democratic capabilities to problem solve. So shifting production uh, and the organization of, of the economy towards problem solving and human capacities. A second point for Block in, in the idea of qualitative growth is applying these principles consistent with normative considerations such as social and environmental objectives. So again, we kind of go back to this idea of why uh, the purpose and intentionality behind uh, the economy. Um, others have spoken about replacing GDP entirely with a GPI or a genuine progress indicator, uh, along with the human capabilities approach. We could imagine a world where we have several ways to think about, consider, and evaluate economic development or whatever it is we want to call it, as opposed to a growth versus degrowth kind of framing. And indeed, uh, much work has been done on the very practice of accounting itself, uh, having a long history not of accounting uh, for the sake of profits, but in various traditions, I can think of the Jesuit tradition as one example, accounting as a means of social valuation and reflecting or mirroring the decisions that we are making collectively as an organization, a group, society, uh, what have you. Um, this uh, comes to mind, the work of Paolo Quarantoni, that is uh, quite good on, on these sorts of things. So um, my position is to kind of start to pressure the institutions that set the conversation around how we measure progress, how we measure development, how we measure the state of our economy and our society, uh, who are endowed with certain kinds of authorities uh, that the public listens to, we can think of the World Bank, the OECD, the, the, the IMF, uh, our governments that tell the public whether they are in good shape or in bad shape. 
and we kind of just go along with it. And I think it's time to begin to pressure these institutions to completely change the narrative as to what is considered progress and not prog progress. Doing so, I believe, will open up a much more beneficial conversation, productive and conducive to overcoming the climate crisis um, based on uh, specifically targeting the qualitative dimensions of uh, what we produce, how we produce it, and the different social relations and relations to ecologies that make that up. Now, with that said, the Green New Deal, if we could think of two things that very much underlie, underlie it, for me at least, one is justice, which is behind the notion of the just transition. The Green New Deal will often get critiqued by centrists and right-wingers for trying to forcefully include certain social uh, goals when it is a, an environmental policy program, right? And I think the fact that we are actually embedding and affirming and not backing down from this notion of justice is very critically important precisely for the things that, uh, you know, the both of us just spoke about, right? Switching what we mean by growth what we mean by progress to something that uh, has to do with human well-being and uh, the good life. Um, secondly, the Green New Deal is trying to create an economic mobilization, and central to that are conversations and debates about how is this thing going to be funded and pay for it. As we know, uh, as MMTers, we see money not as something that is a passive representation of an exchange value or a barter in any kind of sense, but rather a boundless public utility. Um, I noticed something, someone in the chat had, had mentioned something about MMT being about, uh, not necessarily being about money, but being about resources. And I think what's really powerful about MMT is that it opens up the concept of money as the mediating governance instrument to resources. Uh, and so it's not one or the other, and this has deeper philosophical implications, right? We're talking about resources, but we're not talking about resources in some kind of neutral, flat, material thing itself. We're talking about the institutions, the governance systems that organize and keep records of the debts and the obligations and the investments we have to one another around these resources that organize these kinds of resources. So that's very important, too. Um, so a lot of my work in social theory is involved trying to answer this question of why is it so difficult to let go of, of these kinds of narratives that ground us in a certain way of thinking about growth or reifying growth as real. Uh, I think another thing that is common is reifying kind of capital as uh, materially based and independent or external to governance institutions. Uh, and, and so what might be behind that for me and many of us on the Money on the Left co editorial collective, for example, is to look deeply into the kind of unconscious narratives that our culture might have that reproduce um, what we think many of these uh, assumptions are and we take them for granted and that this could create uh, a kind of tunnel vision. Um, if you will. Now, I think many of us would agree that one uh, problematic assumption is the dualism, right, that sets the environment as an object and humans are the subjects and we are here to control that, that object. So we can problematize that. But one thing that has not gone far enough, I believe, um, is the underlying notion that there once upon a time was a state of nature and everything was in balance. And then there was the fall. And I think this biblical notion or story or theology of the fall, that human beings did something wrong, oftentimes they introduced money or they, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they sinned and broke the balance of nature. Uh, and somehow we have to get back to that once in a lifetime, uh, many, many moons ago balance is also part of the problem. And deep to that, um, as the work of uh, Max Seho has looked into, is this notion, and, and uh, uh, Will Beeman and Natty Smith as well through the podcast Superstructure, has looked at the problems of thinking about energy and human creation and human activity 
as the problem in and of itself. And this, the potential and the danger for this underlying some of our eco-politics that in conditions of growing fascism, authoritarianism, tribalism, or any kind of kind of xenophobic tendencies um, have the danger to lure us towards a kind of eco-fascism, um, which I believe is a, a, a very serious danger for what, what we're living. So from that perspective, um, it is imagined, again, even unconsciously, that there is this prior state, prior to social obligation, uh, very much where there is a, like a Lockean man you know, uh, invoking John Locke and, and the, the very man of barter and, and that sort of subject that once existed in a, uh, in a state of nature that was independent to the challenges that we face simply by being interdependent social beings embedded in one, with one another and embedded with nature itself. So what does this tell us? Well, I think many of our analyses of ecological issues and in the environment at large are based on foregrounding material, metabolic, and energy-based processes as some kind of base that we need to focus on first and foremost, and that often apply, and you can see this a lot in the language and the arguments, um, it, it, increasingly in a lot of leftist um, media, but all across the, the ideological specter, whereby there are kind of spectacles, abstract impositions that alienate us away from the reality of uh, the finite world that we have. And of course, money uh, is notoriously known as one of these major alienations. Uh, and I think this is part of the process that has allowed us to commodify money and not see uh, its, its, uh, its nature as a boundless public utility. Now, with that said, um, in a kind of forefronted um, base only analysis, right, relations are zero sum and they're scarce and it's kind of a one to one kind of thing. When applied to economic analysis, we see this in the taxpayer myth. The idea, of course, that there is value circulating around the economy. The only way to do anything about that value is to tax it from somewhere and redistribute it to somewhere else. In reality, environments and humans are ongoing in their reproduction and their growth, but importantly, crucially, on qualitative ends, not on quantitative ends alone. And that makes a huge kinds of difference. This allows us to avoid the conflation of growth and creation at large, or the act of intentionally relating to ourselves in almost an infinite uh, and much more unbounded kinds of ways. We can think of developmental growth and progress not as a singular vision uh, most embodied in the history of modernity, industrialism, and capitalism, but rather something much more open to critical thought and reimagining. Basically, what I mean to say is we can reorient the way that we relate to one another and our, and our ecologies uh, generally. And this, to tie it back to questions about the economy and policy, involves the qualitative composition of our inputs to meet certain kinds of social outputs that are socially constructed. Uh, our inputs and our outputs are not just there in the world. We decide what they're going to be. We can contest them and we can make projections and arguments about what we want outputs to be as well. So if we say we want more care, we want more uh, uh, stewardship, we want more public goods, that is a growth in all of those things that I think would be much uh, very important to the goals that all of us um, share and also would begin to break the scarcity zero-sum mentality that much of the, the public um, has been um, propagandized with. So with that said, we can think of uh, heterodox economics, policymaking as changing the way we think about the economy, prices, employment, markets, consumptions, and firms as not the product of some kind of natural equilibrium uh, and material-based immediate contact 
and even struggle alone, although struggle is important, but struggle alone amongst uh, human beings, but uh, instead holistic processes that are mediated by law, that are mediated by investment, that are mediated by culture uh, at different scales. Um, what this allows us to do, in my opinion, is to think of production as an intentional uh, human, or the intentionality of organizing human relations, um, money and law playing a critical role in this, and thus changing how we think of capitalism away from a natural machine whose motor is profits, but rather simply a logic that gets reified and reproduced, but, but that can also be contested, and that is not an absolutist and universal force of nature. In other words, capital is not autonomous from law uh, or uh, decisions about public investment, and that matters. So with money understood as a public utility, we can invest in decisions about production through a job guarantee that meet various human and social needs that we may have, um, and that try to scale up as quickly as possible the qualitative changes to the composition of our production and our consumption uh, and our inputs um, as fast as we can, independent and agnostic to growth or degrowth. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Andres. Uh, I think I'd like to invite Jack um, into conversation with Andres for a little bit. And if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll definitely go there. But I think um, maybe we can give Jack a chance to respond and, and we can um, get a generative dialogue going. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, looks like it. Um, yeah, that, that was great, Andres. It was really very interesting, um, I think complimentary and um, there's not too much to disagree with. Uh, we uh, we're both um, moving in much the same direction, not only in terms of the specifics of what to be done, but also the overall um, evaluation that um, of, of the goals that we are trying to achieve. I, um, I I guess I have a couple of things to say. I don't like to draw lines and say I'm on this side and you're on that side and I'm right and you're wrong. But nevertheless, when I consider the Green New Deal and what I know about it, um, I think there are a few deficiencies that I would like to address that degrowth, I think, responds to. I will say, first of all, that there's no authoritative version of degrowth. It's not a um, political party. It doesn't have a platform. When you say, what does it stand for? Um, it's uh, you know, you, you infer from a lot of things different people have said who are inspired by the idea of degrowth and put together some kind of package. With the Green New Deal, I think there is, at least when I talk about it, I draw attention to the Green New Deal of H.R. 109 from um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey. Um, and I think that has a good claim to be the definitive statement of the Green New Deal. Now, you can say, and Andres, you can say afterward whether you accept that or not. But when we look at it, um, there's one very important thing that you alluded to that I really learned from studying the Green New Deal, and that is the intimate and necessary connection between environmental justice and social justice. When we reflect on the fact that I showed in one of my slides, but um, didn't push too hard, uh, does have to be pushed when we think about environmental policy making. We reflect on the fact that those um, people, institutions that are most responsible for environmental damage are the entirely separate from those that suffer the most from it. And so I think environmental justice has to be, and, and social justice have to be at the center of any environmental program. And as I say, that's something that I've reflected on a lot more seriously because of studying the Green New Deal. On the other hand, uh, you also pointed out that there's a very heavy productivist emphasis in the Green New Deal. Uh, and I think this is a serious problem. 
Now, we do have to balance having enough uh, in order to make sure that everybody has a satisfactory standard of living. We have to balance that against the um, demand for economic growth and the use of resources. But I think that this, certainly if we look at the way this is discussed in Washington in the congressional resolution, but even more in those people who promoted, for example, Build Back Better and said that it embodied important points in the Green New Deal. I think that this is a problem that having to rely on hammers and nails and a lot of physical production. Um, I would also add that I'm not, I, I don't think the official version recognizes, and I'm not sure how much its proponents recognize, the need for redistribution, the need to change the structure of wealth and income in the society because of the fact that those who are wealthiest are the ones who most um, contribute to the environmental problem, which is inflicted on the least privileged, the most underprivileged in our society. And I think that um, the Green New Deal, as it is understood, um, these things, these it may be possible to resolve these criticisms within the problematic of the Green New Deal, but I don't think they've done so. Um, on the other hand, you know, to repeat what I said at the beginning, I don't like to draw lines. I think that the um, the Green New Deal is an eminently positive proposal, which if we could see it implemented, we would be in much better shape. And so I think these are things really just to reflect upon and discuss rather than see them as disabled criticisms. Did I respond? Is that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jack, for your comments. Yeah, I think uh, a couple of things. Um, First thing I would say is while the congressional resolution is probably like the official document that we have that creates a framing for a Green New Deal in our political process, uh, first, like any document, and I think this is kind of the important thing about law, right? Documents can be amended and reformed and reworked. Um, secondly, you know, it's it's. What I like about the Green New Deal is that it is a framework that allows for bills to be written uh, within a certain kind of, uh, of uh, guide and framework. Uh, I do think that in that framework, even the one proposed in Congress, right, which we can think of as embedded within um, Green New Deal problematizing and thinking outside of our formal political process as well, does in fact emphasize the reshaping and restructuring of wealth and power in society. And that is probably one of the reasons that it has gotten so much resistance from uh, Democrats and Republicans alike with, you know, a, a smaller coalition of, uh, of progressives in Congress supporting it. Uh, I, I, in terms of the, the Build Back Better uh, reality, you know, I do think some climate organizations saw that given what we had, um, it was important to get some aspects of it in, in, in that bill. So that, I mean, I think that speaks to a larger organizing strategy of trying to be everywhere and have uh, our efforts, um, at least the seeds of our efforts in all kinds of institutions as much as possible. Um, now, one thing I think is very important is that a lot of the propositions and pro the proposals for investments are public investments with public money that while they might have a, a productivist element, it, um, creating, for example, a high speed train uh, across the whole United States um, that could be a part of massively transforming mobil mo mobilization and transportation away from cars and towards public transportation is uh, ultimately a very good thing, similarly to uh, building the kind of infrastructure that would allow significant drops in the use of fossil fuels uh, with renewables. Um, but 
as you mentioned, I think part of the process of debating, you know, to what degree we need to, uh, what, what it will look like to consume differently is also something that uh, the Green New Deal as a framework opens up for, for us uh, to do. Uh, so, that, yeah, I think that's, that's where I stand. Yeah, I think part of what I'm hearing you say, Andres, too, especially with the example of building out public transportation infrastructure like a high-speed train, is that we do need to consume more of some resources in, in this sense of, you know, consume with scare quotes, right? But we're going to have to deploy more resources in some areas and less resources in other areas. And so that seems to be one of your provocations to the degrowth is that it's not flatly about using less, but there will be areas where we have to, you know, use more essentially. And I guess I'm, I'm also interested in, in hearing Jack respond to uh, what Andres was saying during the talk about the various orientations to growth um, be because that language is so central to this uh, kind of conversation, whether it's agnostic to growth or envisioning post-growth, but it seems like his challenge to deep growth is, a, is about um, reifying growth as a concept that can be measured in, in a way that is commonly understood. Um, so could you respond to those orientations, Jack? Yeah, you know, I've certainly read criticisms of deep growth that are based on, I think, caricatures uh, in the sense that they you know, are you against um, having flowers grow? Are you against, are you in favor of foot binding? Um, you know, there's not, the, it's not just growth in an absolute sense. It really is a matter of growth in the use of resources and energy. And it is secondary. It is secondary in the sense that uh, judgments on these issues, and Andre certainly indicated this, judgments on these issues should be made in terms of the objectives that any given use have and um you know that the, the growth is sort of irrelevant growth is not the question that has to be answered first even in terms of uh specific, even more narrowly in terms of material and resources but yeah i think you know there's a rule of reason to be applied here doesn't mean that we should leave um our railroad tracks deteriorating so that rains or trains run off the track we should keep them fixed but within an overall plan of public transportation we want to emphasize those kinds of transportation projects that will improve uh, the flow of traffic but without increasing it i mean here one of the problems is of course that whenever you improve uh transportation facilities you produce more um traffic and therefore uh, may wind up with the same problem at a higher scale than you started out with. So, but these are judgments to be made empirically on the basis of the specific conditions. And I certainly wouldn't say that degrowth is, in fa is totally against any kind of growth, any kind of usage of materials that, um, that in the short and narrow compass might seem to be taking an environmental toll. Um, as you said, one other thing about the various standards that we might apply, the various kinds of indicators of um, the state of society, whether the Human Development Index, the Genuine Progress Index, um, the, um, the, the A growth, which I'm not too familiar with, but which, which you mentioned, Andres, these are um, any sort of global definition, any global declaration of what our objectives are, are going, is going to meet up with potential objections in specific cases. And we just have to be reasonable about this. We have to think about what things are really um, going to contribute to the general objectives of a better life within a framework of a healthy planet. Um, but I think that our instinct, our cultivated instinct, is so much to think that growth is good and growth is the solution to any problem that we really have to um, examine 
the kinds of claimed exceptions with very strict scrutiny to see whether they really are going to help us solve the over problem, or overall problem, or create more problems down the road. Yeah, it sounds like then, uh, it sounds like we agree that we need qualitative uh, indicators of, of success yeah. right? mm -hmm. and, and indicators that are not reducible to growth. In the yeah. yeah, there is, I, I think there is a measurement fetish um, in both of our professions, in economics and in sociology, that leads, uh, makes it almost, makes it much easier to respond to precisely defined cost benefit kinds of objections, but to leave out the larger picture. And while we do indeed, you know, we, we do indeed have to worry about some of the cost benefit issues, but we really need to guard against letting ourselves be trapped by them. Andres, did you have anything else you wanted to add in response to that? Yeah, um, well, quickly, I wanted to um, quote Simon Kuznets, who Jack uh, referenced in his presentation. And, uh, it, you know, he was the guy that kind of came up with the GDP idea and, and those kinds of measurements. And it's really interesting because he, he says uh, in 1937, the valuable capacity of the human mind to simplify a complex situation a compact characterization becomes dangerous when not controlled in terms of definitely stated criteria. With quantitative measurements especially, the definiteness of the result suggests, often mis misleadingly, a precision and simplicity in the outlines of the object measured. Measurements of national income are subject to this type of illusion and resulting abuse, especially since they deal with matters that are at the center of conflict of opposing social groups with the effectiveness of an argument is often contingent upon oversimplification. Uh, so, so like this tendency to fetishize statistics, and quanti quantitative, um, um, you know, terms and, and, and outputs, et cetera, um, are used politically to repress and deny all of the qualitative questions um, that are underlying these things. And um, that's, that's very important to me. So when we say growth, I always come back to the idea, grow what? Um, and rejecting that universal impulse to reify and naturalize GDP. Um, another example, I think of the Green New Deal that's important, especially amongst certain rural communities, or I'll use the example of uh, where I grew up in South Texas and many of the Southwest, um, currently, the status quo is to bring jobs in the private prison industry and in border patrol. And culturally speaking, a lot of people, particularly young men, who kind of have uh, the desire to be in nature and to, you know, do certain kinds of things uh, involving the outdoors, find the border patrol as the only way, or even going out to the fields and working in oil as the only way to give meaning to that identity. And the Green New Deal proposes a number of alternatives to this in terms of actual ecological restoration, stewardship, and other forms of articulating and giving form to being in the outdoors. And like, this is critical to this question of like shifting culture, uh, shifting how we understand our relationship to the environment in social terms as well. And, uh, and so like these investments uh, are critical for, for this kind of objective. Yeah, that certainly seems to sing with what Tamara Knopper was suggesting in her talk on MMT and abolition last night as well, that uh, the, there's a jobs program essentially for uh, you know, this kind of carceral or violence work and we need to, and I think it's, it seems everybody's in agreement here that we need to reach full employment, but employment in non-violence work and work that's actually kind of building something that will help us achieve those qualitative uh, indicators that you all are discussing. One other thing that I, I think I thought of when you, you were talking about the uh, obsession with quantification too. 
Scott Ferguson gave a talk on his book as one of the first keynotes of our conference series. And he discussed the concept of hixiety or hixiety. And to me, that those seem closely tied that like, we want to reduce to this, like a, a business of this number. And we can point at this number as kind of self-evident uh, and, and, you know, material, I guess, uh, in, in you know, a very specific sense. Yeah, yeah. Scott, Scott's work is really fascinating and I think important in tracing back these kind of unconscious social logics that we that we uh, have commitments to. Um, and he stems them all the way back to, you know, the late Middle Ages and, and the debates that were theological debates that were had at that time that led to the kind of foundations of modernity and the Enlightenment and whatnot. And one of the things that I find have found incredibly useful for this question of ecology is the difference in thinking between uh, a world that is full of wills and forces that are individuated from one another. So we can think of like bartered agents, rational agents colliding, or uh, e even ecologies and humans as these separate things and they encounter one another and their forces uh, basically kind of a Newtonian physics of everything. And so much of our social science from economics to sociology policy is premised around these encounters and collisions and forces. And what Scott tries to do is create a new framing of a, a holistic picture where causalities and relationships move in different directions and are all embedded in like these nested scales of interdependence. Um, and so it, I think it's quite beautiful because in a economic sense, uh, in terms of the macro economy, you know, you can have the federal government providing spending for, uh, you know, everything from housing to uh, jobs to issuing legal charters to banks and corporations, uh, allowing banks to issue credit. So there's all of this like productive investment happening that's being shaped at different layers. And then, of course, you can think of the state level, people making decisions that give it different shapes, and then uh, the municipal levels, and then we're all agents as well, with agency participating in that. So it kind of rejects this notion that like we have to pick either uh, fully uh, kind of uh, over determinism from above, or the neoclassical fetish of the individual either. And we can instead see a holistic participation where everything matters, everything is shaped from above, but then we also can respond and participate as well. I don't know if, yeah, I'll have to speak to Scott to see if I did that any justice, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty good. I mean, I, I think um, it's hard to like hear that you spell that out and, and, and then also, and like come back to, uh, you know, capital is deterministic and there's no sites of contestation for us. <laughs> that seems to open up a, a wide variety of sites of contestation. Absolutely. I have to add, I, I am, I'm not capable of following the chat while speaking or even listening to a speaker. So I don't, I, I don't know very much of what's in there, but were there any questions or issues that were risen, were raised there that, uh, we should look at. Yeah, I saw some, um, Mike Lewis had a nice citation to the resources are not, they become paper, um, which he pointed out Andres covered in his recent paper at the Global Institute of Sustainable Prosperity. Um, I've, I see a little bit of other discussion. I haven't seen any questions yet. Um, if anybody does have questions, absolutely throw them in the chat. Jack, was there anything else um, you wanted to respond to or, or kind of lay out? Not, not at this point. No, I mean, we, I think we've we've covered it all. Uh -huh. Excellent. Well, then uh, we can wrap up. If there's no other questions uh, from the audience, um, we can still give people a second. But maybe if there's uh, final thoughts that you you all had, you wanted to share, where we can look out for next work, anything you've got coming up, or or just final thoughts on the topic this afternoon. I would just say that the problems are in politics at this point. I mean, we really know 
a lot of what we have to do. We may have disagreements over specific points, but uh, given the combination of forces around the world and in the country and in Washington, uh, it's very hard to know how to move forward. Um, and uh, I wish I had, <laughs> I wish I had at least a partial answer to that, but it's certainly what's on my mind the most. I, I would uh, definitely agree with Jack that the problems are, are political. Um, and I would also emphasize that part of the work we can do as you know, people that are trying to organize or inspire change or reframe things is to question many of the um, perspective framings that the status quo gives us to begin with, that we find ourselves fighting against. Um, and in doing so, however good-willed, we are giving them too much credit. Uh, for speaking in any kind of coherent or descriptively accurate sense. And so I would maybe, and yeah, I would, I would end my talk um, talking about and, and emphasizing the importance of deconstructing our, our own debates um, as one way of many to uh, address this very, very, overwhelming and difficult challenge, which is the climate crisis. Um, because I think that, um, you know, it's not, um, it's not an exaggeration to say that we kind of do need a paradigm shift uh, to really achieve this kind of end goal that we're looking for. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And it, it does sound like we all kind of share the, the same objectives. And I think the vision that you both are articulating is a really beautiful one for the future. So thank you, Andres. Thank you, Jack, for joining us this afternoon. Keep an eye out on Twitter for more uh, events from the MMT conference. It's going on for a long time, so plenty of other good stuff coming down the pike. Uh, so thanks again, Jack and Andres, and thank you to the audience for, for tuning in today. Really happy to have you. Thank you all thank so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.